Welcome to the MMA Roadshow, episode number 97. My name is John Morgan. Cole Coffey? Well, he's not He's not with me right now. I'm in Houston, Texas for USC Fight Night 104. Bermuda is versus Korean Zombie. Meanwhile, Cole Coffey is back home in Las Vegas. Now, there's good reason for that. Uh, my man, Matt Erickson, his mom lives down here just a little bit north of Houston in the woodlands. So, of course, he wanted to sneak down here and see his mom like a good son should. Meanwhile, I am a, a native Texan. I always try to get home to Texas whenever I can. Actually, from Dallas, which I could have snuck up and seen my family as well, but uh, couldn't do that. But uh, at least got to get to my home state, eat a little bit of crawfish, have a little bit of brisket, the things you got to do while you're in Texas. And I am going to stick around for an extra day as well. Uh, I, I had hoped that maybe I'd be in Houston, Texas, and the Dallas Cowboys would make it to the Super Bowl. But alas, they did not. And uh, so I don't know. I'll probably just end up at a, a local purveyor of frosty beverages to catch the game on uh, on Super Bowl Sunday. We'll see how that goes. So, uh, first of all, let me just say, uh, apologize, we are having some issues on iTunes. My man Cole Coffee is trying to work that out. Episode number 96 and 96 and a half uh, are showing up sometimes, not showing up at other times. So we're having some little issues there. We're working on that. Uh, there is SoundCloud. I know you can listen to it there. I think there's a couple other options as well. I'm not going to lie. I'm not very technical. I don't know where all the stuff is. Uh, but apologize that we are having a little bit of issues. I will say if you weren't able to listen to 96 and a half, uh, probably for the best. Um, <laughs> I was a little bit tired, a little bit frustrated, had maybe a, 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 a few too many frosty beverages, and uh, I may have I may have lost control of my mouth just a little bit. There may have been an F-bomb or two or two dozen or so uh, issued on that. So if I offended your humble ears, uh, please, humble ears? No. If I offended your sensitive ears, let me humbly apologize for that. So, uh, But back in business this week. Okay, uh, Houston. Uh, been been here before, of course. Been here for UFC events. Uh, it's the first time I've ever been in a Super Bowl host city. It's buzzing, man. It's, it's buzzing like crazy. You can't believe all the stuff that's going on. Uh, I, I've never been a part of these kind of festivities, so it's just amazing to see all the stuff that's planned around it, all the media that's here, everything that's going on. Uh, and, and it's just loaded up. I mean, in addition to the fights on Saturday night, of course, there's um, a, T- a Taylor Swift concert, I think, at the baseball stadium. So, I mean, you're talking about all all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, hotel rates, good Lord. I, I, we're pretty much some of the only traveling media that, that made down here. As far as the Nationals go, um, I think Sherdog sure is supposed to be here. Dave Mandel, you know, he's their one-man wolf pack. I didn't see him today at Open Workers. I think they're supposed to be here. Um, MMA Fighting wasn't going to be here, but uh, Casey Lydon and Esther, uh, I saw them today. They showed up kind of late, apparently. Uh, well, Casey's actually from here as well, so he's got family, and I think they, they were able to to uh, find a way to make it down here. So uh, anyway, it's uh, not not a lot of travel media, but it's it, man, I'm telling you right now, it's expensive. I got lucky. Uh, if you're ever planning on going to a Super Bowl city, good Lord, make sure you do it plenty of time in advance. I think I booked like two months out, and obviously it wasn't enough because when I went to look, everything in downtown was completely sold out. And then even on the outskirts, you know, we're talking 25, 30 miles outside of town, uh, you know, it's like $300 for a Motel 8 or something like that. And so, to be honest, I, I thought this might be the first event that MMA Junkie missed uh, since, what, I think 2010? Was that when UFC 112 was? The, the, the first Abu Dhabi show was the last show that we didn't have somebody there for. <sighs> so, we, the hotels were insanely expensive. I booked two Airbnbs, like apartments that I found that had instant booking. And as soon as I booked it, I got an email back like, oh, I'm sorry, it's unavailable. So, you know, they just forgot to change their, their rates or whatever for that day. And they were like, uh-oh, this guy tried to book my Super Bowl weekend. I'm canceling them. So I, I was getting worried when I got two cancellations. Fortunately, I found a uh, a, a, a couple here with a guest house. I wouldn't even call it a guest house. It's like a, maybe an old garage that was converted maybe. It's like they, they call it a cottage. It's actually really nice. It's a, uh, you know, it's got a got a little kitchenette in here and you know, bed, bathroom, office, all that stuff. So everything I need. So I'm staying in the, a neighborhood called the Heights if you're familiar with Houston. That's where I am, sitting around in somebody's backyard basically. <laughs> uh on a converted garage uh with a little bit of a frosty beverage. In fact, I need to go ahead and just Oh yeah, there we go. Having a little frosty beverage and uh talking to you guys. Now, um uh, 
you may say, what the hell, because I've had a couple people ask me, what the hell is the UFC doing trying to book a UFC, you know, around the Super Bowl? Well, you know, you'll know this has always been a pay-per-view weekend. Uh, it was always in Las Vegas. And I do kind of like the strategy of them not doing it on, on pay-per-view. It's just so hard for them to get media, you know. I mean, media is focused on the Super Bowl. And there's no question about it. Sports media is focused on the Super Bowl. It's hard for them to get it. And so they said, "Look, man, let's take it off pay-per-view. Let's go to uh, let's go to Fox Sports One with this one, FS One. This is this is a better strategy for us overall." And to be honest, I, I think I have to agree with it. Now, this is a Fox broadcast Super Bowl, so Fox kind of wanted to put everything together, have like a big, you know, superstar type weekend. It's cool. You get a lot of you know cross promotion there. You get a lot of. Uh, you know, interplay between the two sports, so to speak. You know, you've had UFC stars at Radio Row all week, and you know, I'm sure on Saturday night you're going to have a lot of celebrities who are in town already coming in for the Super Bowl that'll be there. That'll look good for the for the UFC. Uh, I'm sure, to be honest with you, there's network executives and advertising executives and people like that that whose names we will never know, but who are the power brokers uh, in television. I'm sure that the UFC will be kind of buttering them up and, and hosting them as guests to kind of give them the VIP treatment. So that's what's going on. Now, important to note, the Fox, the Fox does not broadcast every Super Bowl. The way the contract works with the Super Bowl is it rotates between uh, three networks. That is uh, CBS, NBC, and Fox. So Fox only has it every third year. So to say, well, oh, maybe, you know, maybe I know there's always going to be a UFC in the host city every year. We don't know that that's necessarily going to be their strategy. You know, if Fox wasn't involved, you know, would they maybe go somewhere else? I don't know. So we'll find out. Uh, the, due to the nature of the crowd and what's going on, the space that they needed, the, I mean, the fighters are actually staying out by the airport. Uh, they're at the uh, the Sheridan George Bush International, I believe, is where they're at. Uh, so even they're not getting to stay in uh, in town. Now, not a big deal. There's no ceremonial weigh-ins this week. So, I mean, really the only time they're going to be having to make that shuttle ride is on fight night. Uh, so tomorrow morning, Friday morning, we always sit down and record this on Thursday night. So uh, we will have the official weigh-ins first thing in the morning. No ceremonial weigh-ins afterwards. Um, basically, from what I understand, you know, all the arenas are booked. Everything's done. Uh, the Toyos, Toyo, Toyota Center, which is hosting the fights, is actually uh, playing host to a basketball game. The Rockets are going to play there uh, tomorrow night, Friday night. So, really, there just wasn't a need for it. On top of that, you know, there's so much programming with other stuff. The, the Fox just said, hey, we don't we don't really need a weigh-in show. So, if, or, <coughs> excuse me, a ceremony weigh-in. I think they're still going to do some type of pr- promotional show, um, but just not the ceremony weigh-ins. Now, you know, is this a sign of what's to come with the weigh-ins? Probably. Probably. I mean, the UFC's already decided, as we've talked about before, <coughs> excuse me, no more ceremonial weigh-ins for uh, Fight Pass-only shows. Um, they're not, they're not going to do that. So if it's only on Fight Pass, FS1 doesn't ask for the weigh-ins, so they won't get it. And it just keeps the UFC, it keeps their cost down. You know, that you don't have to rent an arena. You don't have to build a stage. You don't have to pay for, you know, everything that's going on that day. So... I think eventually we'll see the ceremonial weigh-ins go away. I still honestly would like to see something in the afternoon in front of the fans. I mean, the face-offs. We've talked about it before, but you got to have the face-offs, right? I mean, that's drama. That's fun, you know? And I, I do hate the charade of just putting, you know, some, putting somebody on a scale that's not even plugged in and a commissioner pretending to read and, and all that. Yeah, I I don't I think we can get rid of that, but I think you still gotta have the face offs in the afternoon, man. You got to let let you know let them get rehydrated. We're, we're gonna do face offs tomorrow, so we'll have video of that from from the official weigh-ins. We'll have video of that on, on MMA Junkie, and of course I'll be live streaming it as well on uh, Facebook Live. But you know, that's still kind of early in the morning. It's still it's at the hotel. It's not in front of a crowd and. Um, you know, it's, it's just kind of a weird situation. So I, I don't know. I think we'll definitely see some changes. I think we'll probably see it uh, once the new TV contract is in place right now. You know, the, the USC is contracted to deliver a certain number of, of events and footage and all the things that are surrounded that. And, you know, sponsors have paid for advertising time to have their, to have their brand on the scale. You know, think about that. You know, that's been sold. So, so you know, you can't just pull the scale right away. It's you, you can't make changes on the fly. As easy as it may s- seem to be, like, well, let's just fix this up. But, you know, there's there's things that are already in place and money that's been spent and all that. So, can't be done just yet. So, uh, but I think we will see it. So, anyway, uh, Dennis Bermudez versus Chan Sung Jung, the main event, kind of a I don't know, I guess an unexpected fight when they announced it. But what the hell would you expect? Who who would you expect the Korean Zombie to fight? The guy's coming back for more than three years on the shelf. And the last fight uh, was in August 2013 uh, when he lost a title fight to Jose Aldo. Now, that, think about this, too. Now, not only has it been more than three years, that was his only fight of 2013. He also only fought once in 2012, 
And that was that awesome win over Dustin Poirier. Uh, actually, that was in uh, uh, easy for me to remember. That was in May of 2012. I remember because I uh, watched that one on TV because I, I couldn't make it out there because that was the week that my son was born. So I definitely couldn't go there. So we're talking about a guy that hasn't fought in three years. And then, you know, even when he was fighting at, at the tail end there, wasn't fighting that much. Now, a, a big portion of why he took off, of course, was the military job. In, in South Korea, you do have to do a couple years of uh, mandatory service. He did that uh, thanks, to the, uh, thanks to the U.S. forces out there. Command Sergeant Major John Wayne Troxel, who's a big MMA fan. Uh, of course, we got to meet him. We went out there in, in Seoul, uh, what, about a year and a half ago, which was awesome. And he was a huge MMA fan. And, you know, he had actually said, hey, you know, I've actually checked in on Chan Sung Jung and talked to him. Uh, and, you know, the job that the, that the Korean military doing was basically a desk job. They, you know, they had him th doing paperwork and that sort of thing. So that worked out good. He got to wrestle. If you talk to the Korean zombie, he'll say, listen, uh, I I'm better. Man, I had a chance to let my body heal. I had a chance to rest up and, and, and injuries are gone. He looks bigger to me than I remember. Again, now we're talking about a couple years, but he looks a little bit more like muscular and filled out. Um, in, in just the, the brief interactions I've had with him. Uh, I had a chance to see him at the hotel, and uh, he spoke a, a little bit of English, just a, just a touch of English, you know, it's good to be back, uh, that sort of thing. So, you know, I, I think I'm excited for him to be back because he is such a fun fighter. But a lot of question marks, man. I just – that kind of time off, I don't, I don't know how you, how you know what to expect. You know, I, I had to tape my – Staff prediction earlier, and I went with Dennis Bermudez, but, I mean, not that Chan Sung Jung can't win this fight, but, oh, yeah, man. Man, if I was a gambler, man, I just I just don't think I could put any money on this thing because I just feel like we have no idea what we're going to see, right? I mean, you're, you're guessing. And if you're guessing, that, you know, that doesn't seem smart. So I, I went with Dennis Bermudez. I mean, he is on a two-fight winning streak. Uh, I did pick up wins over Honey Jason and Tatsuya Kawajiri recently. He'd had a couple losses before that. He's actually number 12 in, in the latest uh, USA Today Sports MMA junkie, MMA featherweight ranking. So, you know, this is a big fight for him. Certainly, Bermudez is going to have the wrestling advantage. There's no doubt about that. Um, but he's going to be facing a little bit of a height height discrepancy. Uh, Korean Zombies, I want to say a good three, maybe even maybe even four inches taller, depending on, you know, if you're just reading the stats is one thing. But when you stand next to him, man, they, they just seem like different body types. You know, obviously, Chan Sun Jung is a – like I said, he does look a little bit more muscular, but he seems a lot leaner and, and almost lankier in some respects, whereas Dennis Bermudez is, is uh, the, you know, the stocky wrestler type or whatever. So, interesting matchup. Again, to me, it's just, I, it just to me, it comes down to the question marks around Chan Sung Jung. I just feel like I can't answer that. I feel like anything I say is, is basically just guessing. I mean, we saw him at the workouts, and he did look good, but, I mean, hitting pads is, is, is not getting in a fight. It's not going full speed and having that timing. So, um Open workouts were today. Like I said, we, we saw we saw both those fighters there. Dennis definitely put on more of an effort, you know, more of a full workout or whatever. It seems like he's really enjoying the moment. It seems like he's really uh, is soaking it all in. He actually went to the media day earlier in the week, the big uh, Super Bowl media day, I should say, and actually was posing as a reporter for, for the UFC and got in some questions and uh, kind of kind of wild, you know. He's he's enjoying it all. It's definitely having fun, and uh, and as he said, he's just trying to soak it all in. It's crazy because I, I, the, <laughs> the open workouts today were the only time that we've had a chance to talk to the main eventers, right? And it was bizarre because literally nobody was asking questions. Now, maybe it's just an I'm an a-hole and I ask too many questions or I, I don't know. I, I don't know. But this is the entire scrum for Dennis Bermudez, the main event fighter for UFC Fight Night 104. I'm going to play the entire scrum right now. And listen, it's 90 seconds long. Just so, so talk about this experience, being in the main event, Super Bowl week. It seems like you're soaking it all up, you know, going to media day and stuff. What's yeah, like for you? it's good, man. Um, I'm just trying to enjoy it, you know, and not worry about, you know, what's actually at stake here, right? This is a super, super big uh, opportunity, super big scene here. Uh, so I'm just really just trying to have fun with it and just, you know, have fun with the whole experience, you know, that all the hard work's done. You know, let's go out there and do what I do, you know, I'll be fine. How do you prep for a guy that we haven't seen fight in three years? How do you get ready for him? We just, we, our strategy is we just looked at his, uh, his most recent uh, fights, you know, um, and we're just getting prepared, prepared for him to have not skipped a beat. You know, we're ready for the best Korean zombie. We want to fight the best Korean zombie. 
What do you, you talk about what's at stake? What do you think is at stake here for you? Because since he's been out, he's not in the rankings, but of course he's definitely a, a name guy as well. So what, what do you think? Guys? Right in my head, I think he's probably a top five guy. You know what I mean? Um, he was in the top five when he uh, left for military leave. Um, so I mean, I think even uh, a win over him probably moves me up the ranks a little bit. Um, and I don't think about losing. And you talk about your division, man. It's a fun division right now, man. A lot of talented guys. What do you think this does earn you? Where do you think you should be next if you pick up a win here? Uh, after picking up a win here, realistically, I would like to fight Max Holloway. He's got, uh, I've got a win over him, and he's got the interim belt, man. That's the, only, that's the reason why I signed up to be in the UFC, is to be a world champion. Yeah, that's it. That's the whole thing. That's your main event. Um... Bizarre kind of caught me a little bit off guard, to be honest with you. It was so short. I mean, Des Bermuda's packed a lot of quotes in there, man. He talks fast, and, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's firm in what he wants and, and saying that he wants Max Holloway. You know, I don't know if that's – I don't know if he's quite in line for that fight, and it sounds like uh, Max Holloway is actually going to be doing some some filming, doing a shooting a movie, and then he'll be looking to do the, the unification bout with Jose Aldo, of course, at some time this year. But uh, I don't know, man, just weird. I, I mean, there wasn't a ton of media there, but I, I don't – I don't know. Just no questions at all. It seemed very, very bizarre to me. So, uh, like I said, he did call out Max Holloway. Max Holloway didn't know this because it was kind of happened around the same time. But there's actually an interview on MMA Junkie as well with Max Holloway. So if you want to check that out, do that. You'll see that uh, we've USA Today Sports has a reporter and a uh, filming studio basically out there at uh, Radio Row. So they've got a, a little booth there. I'm not going to lie, I wish we would have known about it because we've got a general sports reporter there and, and, and she doesn't know MMA. There's just, I mean, it's just fair enough. It, it'd be like sending me to cover a baseball game. You know, like I played it when I was a kid, but I'll be damned. I, hell, I looked at a Dallas Mavericks box score the other night uh, when I was sitting there watching and, and, and uh, a TV and I don't know a single player on the team. I didn't recognize a single name. Dirk Nowitzki didn't play. Uh, I guess he's, he's so old now that, you know, he doesn't play on consecutive nights or whatever. They're resting him up. But I, I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody. You know, so I can't blame somebody. It'd be, it'd be impossible for me to do that. But so, you know, she's doing the best she can, you know, covering MMA. But, damn, I wish I would have known about it. So maybe we could have had an extra body here. And, you know, myself could have been there uh, asking questions. Or, you know, maybe the young Mike Bond would be out there. Or who knows? You know, I, so I, hopefully the next time there's a UFC around a Super Bowl, I will know about this ahead of time. And I will make sure that, we're so, that somebody's there. But – uh, Max Holloway did do an interview there. Uh, Juliana Pena was there. Uh, it's Juliana Pena. What am I talking about? Juliana Pena wasn't there. Valentina Shevchenko was there. <laughs> Amanda Nunes was there. Yair Rodriguez was there. Uh, Matt Mitrione was there. And on Friday, actually, uh, Anthony Johnson scheduled to be there. And USC President Dana White, who has been ducking me. See, if I'd have had a booth there, we could have gotten that interview done because he's been ducking me. I'm going to try to get that rescheduled soon. So pay attention to that. That'll be streaming. They're streaming live on Facebook, and then we'll, we'll put it on our uh, MMA Junkie Facebook as well. And then uh, if there's anything particularly good out of it, we'll take it, and we'll actually put a uh, highlight and, and put it on full MMA Junkie as well. So uh, a lot of content coming from Super Bowl Radio Row, which is which is pretty cool. Now, um, while I was not allowed to attend that, uh, our fight week did kick off on Wednesday. I flew in Tuesday night. Got things started on Wednesday morning. Had a couple of sit-down interviews. Uh, always like to grab a few extra people. You know, if we're, if we're coming to town, I don't want to talk to three or four people. I want to talk to seven or eight or nine, you know, and, and, and get a few extra interviews. You know, just a couple of quick updates. Check in, see how people are doing. And, uh, listen, one of the people I, I wanted to talk to and got a chance to talk to was Beck Rawlings. I, I, I have to admit it, I love talking to Beck. Uh, I, you know, she's a, a controversial figure, to say the least. I know some people are not fans. I do happen to be a fan. I think that... You know, she uh, she speaks openly and freely about a lot of things, and, and I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I did want to talk to her. I guess, you know, uh, I'm, I'm always kind of tuned into to moms and dads as, as my child is getting older, as little man Eli is, is growing up. You know, what it's like for her. You know, as a single mom, she, she spends time away from her kids, and then, you know, she, her last fight out, she lost to Paige Van Zandt. And, and I know how, what a big fight that was for her. You know, what does it feel like to, to go back home? I mean, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What I mean – Gosh, every fighter sacrifices and hates to lose, but, you know, when part of that price that you paid was to be around, you know, be away from your kids for so long, uh, man, you know, does it hurt even more? So I asked her about that. I asked her about a number of topics. Of course, her fight was in there as well, and, you know, she's rematching Tisha Torres at UFC Fight Night 1 and 4. That was a fight that happened on the season of the Ultimate Fighter that they were on, and Tisha Torres actually picked up a decision there. So this is a rematch. 
And uh, probably no surprise, <laughs> Beck's not all that impressed with Tisha. I don't think Beck's uh, impressed with many people at all. So, uh, but it was just fun to talk to her. So, uh, while I, uh, you know, re up on my frosty beverage over here because I got nobody to help out. I'm just sitting here all by myself. Uh, so while I do that, listen to uh, listen to my conversation with Beck Rawlings. Probably don't want to spend too much time talking about your last fight, but let's go back to it. I mean, uh-huh. uh, obviously a frustrating night for you. Um, what kind of lessons do you take out of that? Um. Look, it's no lesson that I haven't learned previously. Like my debut fight, I got kicked in the head and I got knocked out um, cold. I was like out for like a minute. Um, the only thing frustrating about my last loss was I wasn't out. Um, I feel like the ref didn't give me a chance to fight back. Like he kind of just stepped in and I saw his legs coming for me and I was like, well, thanks, thanks bro. But um, that was the only frustrating part. You never know, like I, I could have been done, but he didn't give me that opportunity to prove that I wasn't done so um, yeah that's one thing that I did I guess I did learn is refs still kind of feel like we're made of glass because we have vaginas and boobs Um, (laughs) which is kind of frustrating it's like in this sport we are actually treated like the most equal um, out of all the like professional sports we get paid the same we get the same opportunities yet we're still looked at differently inside the cage by refs and judges and things like that. So it's kind of shitty in that part, but, you know, it's only young. We're only young in the UFC, so hopefully that changes. You think that's a like a conscious thing, or you think it's almost like subconscious that, you know, yeah. they don't even really mean to err on that way, but that's what they do? Yeah, for sure. Because some of the, like, some stoppages I've seen in the previous, like, the the latest UFCs, like, if that was a girl for sure, it would have got stopped earlier, and they just let them take... Um, like almost like unneeded damage, um, which is kind of frustrating, but it is what it is. There's nothing you can do about it. You know, I think I think maybe being more vocal about it will kind of make them aware of it maybe, so they kind of do check themselves and not step in prematurely. Um, but yeah, other than that, like I was happy with my performance with my fight, like the first round was perfect. Um, I was thrown off a little bit by her unwillingness to kind of engage. Um, I thought she was just gonna come and come move forward like she always does, but she kind of played a different game, and I was like, oh, that's, like this is what I was expecting. Um, the crazy kicks and things like that in the first round, I was just like, what the fuck? Like, what are you fucking doing? <laughs> like it was like really, and then then shit like that happens in round two, and it's like ah, like it, I, it's why everyone loves this sport. It's because anything can happen, and that proved it that night that yeah she can throw some stupid Hail Mary kick up in the air that I laughed at in round one and catch you so it's that that's yeah that's funny where do you stand I mean taking male and female out of the equation just as a fighter where do you stand on like fighter safety as a referee's concern because I think some people are like well they're they're protecting me long term but other Mm -hmm. fighters are saying you know each each win or loss can cost me a lot of money let me go as long as I can absolutely like it's we're choosing to be fighters. This is what we love to do, so let us fight. Um, it's not like we're going into this fight not knowing what we're getting ourselves into. Uh, we've signed a contract to to win a fight, you know, um, and the potential of taking damage is like we know what we're into, so let us do what we've come to do. Um, and I feel like judges and referees, they don't realise that their decision, it's not just like a bad night for them and they cop flack from fans like you could potentially ruin a fighter's career you're potentially make like losing money for that fighter like half of their purse and it could be the last straw for for that fighter and they could get cut and you know not have a job and be homeless like it's make or break for some of us fighters and I feel like with so the stakes are so high that I feel like they should be held more accountable for their shit and they should educate themselves more and um, be a little bit better at their job. Yeah. What's it like for you? I know every fighter makes sacrifices, of course, but you being a mom as well. What's, what's it like for you, you know, after you have a frustrating night like that to, to, to go home and, you know, is it is it great to be around family again and recharging or is it even more frustrating because you know all the sacrifice you make and then don't get the result that you want? Um, for sure. It was heartbreaking. You know, I spent eight weeks of my life over in the U.S. away from my family, away from my kids. Um, I sacrificed a lot and I sacrificed a lot of money as well to come over here and do um, what I have to do to in order to step into that cage. So yeah, it sucks. It sucks to lose. Um, but it's also nice to go home to a loving family, <laughs> my kids that love and that I love and adore. So um, 
yeah, it's, it's shitty. I feel like it kind of hurts a little bit more because I sacrifice so much for what I want to do. Um, but yeah, losing sucks either way, whether regardless whether you're rich, poor, um, <laughs> have kids or not. Like we're we're fighters and we're competitive and we want to be the best in the world and we want to win. Um, so yeah, losing sucks regardless. Well, so you see, giving you a big opportunity here, I mean, a respected opponent. Um, how did this fight come about? And I mean, obviously, you guys have a history. Were you campaigning for this at all? No idea. Like, I was kind of like, oh, oh, cool. Um, it was, yeah, it was completely random to me. I, I put my hand up to fight on the last Australian card, and I kind of got shoved off that card because of um, the China card that got cancelled. They kind of had to squeeze bouts onto that. So I've just been kind of just waiting, like, hey, can I fight? Hey, can I fight? Um, and they came to me with t-shirts. So I was like, hell yeah, like I've wanted a rematch ever since our first fight in the Ultimate Fighter. I didn't ask for it. I wasn't very vocal like about it, but you know, I'm going to take it if it's given to me. So yeah, definitely very random and it, yeah. It's interesting. Have you been watching her career? You know, as obviously since you guys met, I mean, have you watched her and, and kind of seen how she's improved or changed or that sort of thing? Um, yeah, like I try to tune into all the strawweight fights, obviously their potential um, opponents for me so and I like watching the girls fight like I could miss a show if it's just got the guys on it but I, I very rarely miss the girls fights um, so yeah I've been keeping track of you know what she's doing what she's been up to um, I honestly don't think she's changed at all she still has the same the same um, game plan same style she's you know volume punches in bunches um, still can't finish a fight to save a life um, still hits like a little pussy <laughs> Just keeping it real. But yeah, it's like she's she's a good fighter. She's proven that she's a good fighter. I'm not taking that away from her, but I feel like she hasn't evolved. Very much. So is this, I don't want to say personal, but is it special because you, you kind of get something back or, or do you just have to throw that out and, and it's just another fight? It's just another fight. You know, like no matter who I'm fighting, I want to win. Um, it's nice, obviously, to get a rematch. And, you know, I'm always coming out there to prove something. I need to win. Um, and I like to finish the fights early, like you want to get in and out, so that's the game plan. But um, she's a tough opponent and she's proved that, so it could be, could be a decision, could be a long drawn out fight, you never know. <laughs> a lot of straw weights here, by the way, right? I mean, it yeah, it's like the straw weight showdown. Right, so it. what's that been like? I mean, has it been fun <laughs> to kind of be reunited with people, or has there been some cross looks? What's, no, what's no, it it's been like? cool. It's cool to have like a bunch of girls on the card. I think, I think it's awesome. Um, we obviously bring something, a different dynamic to cards, and I feel like the fans are excited to see all of us throw down. So yeah, it's really cool. Definitely. Well, I know this is a big fight for you. Uh, what are the goals this year? Are you picking up a win here? What's uh, what's what's the goals for 2017? Uh, look, I want to fight as often as I can. I need money. I need to support my kids, so um, I'm trying to bank them up. But not everything goes to plan sometimes. But yeah, look, I'd I'd like to fight three times this year if possible. I'm really, really hoping for the 125 division. Um, 115 is just getting harder and harder to make. Um, I've had a lot of medical issues due to trying to make 115 and it's kind of shitty. So um, I'm really like pushing to ho hopefully get that division sooner than later. Um, that would be my ideal. My ideal year would be 125 and I'm like straight there. I've, I could fight four or five times at 125 a year, um, make a whole bunch of fucking money. but. <laughs> 115 is what I'm stuck with right now, so yeah. It doesn't seem like you're alone in that boat, so I mean... No. What does it feel like as being one of those people when they're like, well, we just can't do it, we just can't do it. Oh, by the way, here's 145. Yeah, it's, I was kind of like, really? I was like, uh, like, why? Right. I was kind of confused, and I think that everyone was kind of confused by it. Um, but it's cool, obviously, that they want to bring in more divisions. I was just kind of a little, you know, upset that it wasn't the division I want. I was like a little spoiled brat, like, mm, <laughs> it's my division. Um, but yeah, it's cool, obviously, like, gives more opportunity for the women. And, um, you know, a few years ago, we weren't even in the UFC, so we've come a long way. But yeah, it's kind of it's kind of sucky when there's, there's a lot of big 115ers that aren't natural 115ers, and we're, you know, we're really hurting ourselves and our bodies trying to make this weight, and it's, it's not cool, so sooner rather than later would be better for 125 fingers crossed we'll, we'll see how that plays out first first step i guess is getting the win on saturday i guess Absolutely. when you play this one out in your mind you know how, how do you see this one going down um you know i've played it out like i i'm a big believer of visualization and i've played it out a, a lot of different ways um 
you know, ideal, obviously, you, you want to get that knockout, like, highlight reel, but um, I feel like it can, it can go any, any way. Like, I, I feel like I'm a better boxer, I'm a better grappler, um, and I'm just, I just bring every, all round, I think I'm better. Um, and, you know, I'm going in there to hurt people. That's my number one thing that I always say is I'm actually going in there to finish you. I'm going in there to try and hurt you and knock your head off. Um, I feel like she's not the same. She's going in there to score points. She's going in there to, to win um, by a decision. Like, it's so, that's kind of what makes this match up a little bit more exciting because um, we've both kind of got two different things on our mind. But yeah, hopefully I could win by knockout. That would be like my ideal way. Welcome back to the MMA Road Show. That was Beck Rawlings. Hopefully you enjoyed hearing from her. Like I said, I know she likes to stir the pot a little bit sometimes, but uh, has honestly become one of my favorite interviews. I just enjoy uh, picking her brain a little bit. So, listen, if you like what you're hearing, do me a favor. Do me a favor. Go into iTunes. Leave us a, a rating, a review, if you will. You could do like a D Hyder. He, he left us said, well, first of all, he said five stars. So that's that's key right there. And then he said, love hearing the MMA Roadshow every week, especially the Anna Hass. John and Cold Coffee bring that special blend we've all come to love. Keep it up, guys, and don't change a thing. Much appreciated, Mr. Hyder. Uh, yeah, and I will be doing Anna Half. It'll, it'll be me. I'll try to grab somebody else. I'll see I'll see what I can do. I know you probably get bored uh, hearing my damn voice, but uh, not a lot of media here, not a lot of options, but I've got that whole Sunday to myself. Uh, so I think I haven't seen the work schedule yet. Actually, watch i'm gonna end up scheduled to work i didn't even talk to dan about it i'm gonna get scheduled to work during the super bowl <laughs> uh we'll see what happens uh but yeah we'll be doing a little and a half for this week so if uh, football's not your thing you can just pick up on uh, the the post fight ufc talk all right let's talk about things. you know since we're talking about football how about this kind of mma news uh have you guys seen the the, the news with the uh is it the los angeles raiders the oakland raiders good lord yeah see talking about other sports the oakland raiders uh, supposedly moving to Las Vegas, but in, in need of some financing. Sheldon Adelson, the casino magnate there, backed out. He was supposed to be spending a ton of money, a couple hundred million dollars. I believe like $600 million was his, was what he was going to be willing to invest. And now he's saying he is out. Guess what? The Raiders need a bunch of money to move to Las Vegas. Can you think of any football-passionate billionaires with some money to spend in Las Vegas? Crazy, right? Maybe the Fertitas could step in. Now, I guess the interesting part is that, again, not following it that closely, uh, but the owner of the Raiders has said that he's not willing to give up ownership of the team. And I think the money that's needed is, is not to go straight to the team. It's to help finance the stadium. Uh, now, whether the Fertitas would be willing to own the stadium or not or own a big chunk of it uh, by investing in it, I don't know. Is that enough skin in the game for them? I mean, then, then you're not really part of a team. You know, you just got a facility. I'm sure it could be profitable. I mean, oh man, if you've seen the artist renderings for the stadium they're talking about in uh, in Las Vegas, <laughs> it looks amazing, man. It looks really cool. And of course, you know that would host uh, UNLV football games, which you know UNLV football is not that good. But you know, I'm sure you could get other regional teams. I'm sure USC would want to come out and play a couple games there or something. Maybe get Arizona State to come in. Who knows? I mean, then then you know concerts and all that stuff. So I mean, you find ways to fill your stadium, right? You're not just trying to get those eight home games a year in the NFL schedule. But, you know, would the Fertitas come in if they're not an owner in the team? I don't know. But how crazy would that be, huh? I mean, they are absolute football fanatics. And uh, for the money that they made off the USC, if they could reinvest that in the NFL, it does seem like things are lining up nicely for them. Cole Coffey, if he was here, he would tell you he thinks the whole thing was a setup to begin with. <laughs> he thinks they were they were always going to uh, buy into this team and you know always going to be a part of the Raiders ownership group. I, I don't know if that's the case. I think maybe things are just kind of unfolding that way. But uh, Cole Coffey, the, ever the, con the conspiracy theorist that he is, believes that Sheldon Adelson, uh, who is friendly with the Rotitas, was basically just a placeholder for them to get the ball rolling, and then and then they'll jump in. So we'll see how it plays out. But find it interesting nonetheless. Uh, more UFC-related news. Uh, I have had a lot of people asking me uh, through various forms of uh, text and WhatsApp and Twitter and some other things uh, about May 29th in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, I think that's going to happen. So there is going to be a Memorial Day weekend show. It's just not going to be in the U.S. That would be an FS1 show. 
uh, that would happen in your, I believe it's an FS1 show. Pretty sure it's an FS1 show, which might be an afternoon show, I guess, because I imagine it would probably take place at night in Europe. Probably be a, an afternoon show on, uh, what would that be, a Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon? That's going to be happening over there. So I think that's going to happen. Um, I haven't heard anything official from USC officials, so unfortunately I can't, you know, break news. But, uh, oh, yeah, I think it's a Sunday. I'm looking at it right. Yeah, so Sunday morning show, huh? Kind of cool, right? No, Nothing really going on at that time. That's just when baseball's going, so... All right, I think it's gonna happen. I think it's gonna happen. Uh, I've, I've heard, I've heard, but I haven't, have not heard anything uh, official yet. So imagine we'll uh, be getting some some uh, official reports very soon. It does sound like they're already starting to try and book some fights for that. So uh, sounds like Europe is gonna another show. Also, since we've been talking about football, um, I believe haven't heard official here yet either. But uh, in April, let's just say. That Chiefs fans, who happen to also be UFC fans, might find themselves very happy as well. How about that? And we'll just leave it at that. I think we all know what we're talking about there. I, again, nothing official there, but uh, sounds like Chiefs fans may have something to get excited about. All right, uh, I did want to talk about one thing really quick because I think this is is, is important. Uh, the young Mike Bond tweeted the other day. Well, when I say the other day, how about yesterday? On Wednesday, February the 1st, uh, Misha Serkinov, Rick Story, and Lorenz Larkin have all been removed from the rankings by the UFC. Um, and, and he said that they're no longer under contract. Now, uh, we also saw today, I believe, reported that Tiago Tavares uh, has gone elsewhere as well. We'll be fighting in Brazil. Now, uh, did some digging around here with the people that I could talk to here on the ground in in, uh, in beautiful Houston, Texas. It is beautiful. The weather's so nice, by the way. Denver was cold. It's been beautiful here. But important to note, um, the UFC right now is bloated. They got too many people on the roster, and they need people to go away. To be honest with you, they got they got to cut contracts. They have too many fighters under contract. The thing just keeps growing and growing and growing, and they've got to do some culling. So that means they got to get rid of people and. How do they do it? Well, if you fight out your contract and you turn down a contract offer from them, you're no longer under contract at that point. And, and it's my understanding that's what's happened to every single person here. It's not we're cutting you. It's not, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're letting you go go somewhere else. It's like, hey, listen, we just don't have anything for you right now. And if, if we don't resign you, then we don't have to have that clock start ticking on contracts where – you know, you, you basically owe somebody a fight or you, or you end up defaulting on their deal. And so it's my understanding that the UFC has, has been in a couple of these situations and offered money, and the uh, the fighter says, you know what, that's not really the contract money I was looking for. I'm going to go test free agency. And at this point, the UFC says, fair play, good luck to you. You know, it's been a pleasure. Maybe we'll do business in the future. And it's, uh, it's an interesting position to be in as a fighter because the UFC is not telling you they're done. But if you don't get the offer you want from anywhere else, guess what? Now you're just sitting around. And now you got to go back to the UFC and say, hey, uh, yeah, you know that offer you threw out there? Can we can we talk about that again? So it's an interesting time. I mean, people are definitely wanting to test free agency, and, and as right they should, man. If you're a fighter, you got to cash in while you're here, right? Make as much money as you can. Get out and move on to the next phase of your life. This is uh, As the UFC matchmakers have always said, this is uh, not a career. It's an opportunity, and you've got – a window to capitalize, so capitalize as much as you can. But be careful, because if there's not if there's not an offer on the other side, the grass may not be greener. So interesting time to be a fighter. I think everybody's rushing to free agency, and rightfully so. But I think you also have to be wary of you know kind of what the UFC is is offering, and you know pay attention to that as well. Otherwise, right now it's a delicate position because they've got too many fighters on the roster. I mean, they're over 600 right now. They need to trim down. And so you're seeing fighters like this who said no to a deal, and now they find themselves without a position. So this will certainly be something that uh, that we want to follow. And, uh, yeah, see where these guys end up. It's interesting. From everything I was told and talked to people, it's not something done with malice. I mean, you know, the the, the one name that really stuck out there to me, I mean, Lawrence Larkin kind of made it clear, right, that, hey, man, I, I basically went out. You know, I'm, I'm going to test the waters, and I don't know. I mean, he's to me, he's even made it sound like, he just doesn't really care for the UFC anymore. Maybe, maybe that's not true. Maybe that's miscategorizing him a little bit. But, you know, it seems to me like he's, you know, kind of looking elsewhere. Rick Story, tough as nails, man. That dude, 
every time that he steps in there, man, you know you're getting a fight, right? So that one kind of stood out for me a little bit. I was like, man, that's man, Rick Story's a tough dude. But you know, I thought, well, he's you know he's had these injury issues and he's and he's had some you know all this stuff with the discs in his back and neck. I mean, like crazy stuff, you know. So maybe they just decided it was best. But the one that stood out to me is Misha Serkinov. I mean, the guy is four and zero in the UFC with four finishes. Certainly, they're not going to cut him. I mean, that's that's kind of what got me poking around. I'm like, that that makes no damn sense whatsoever. And uh, sure enough, that's kind of what I was told is that listen, uh, contract offers were made. I mean, they they were out there. People weren't happy with them, so if they weren't happy with them, that's that's their choice. And now they gotta decide if they can get something from another organization or not. So, interesting times. I mean, does 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 Misha Serkinov, you know, a Canadian light heavyweight, have a lot of value to Bellator? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they've got some talent in their light heavyweight division. There's some matchups you could make there. Does Misha Serkinov move the needle? He's certainly tough as hell. It's fun to watch fight. Does he sell tickets? Don't know. Don't know. It's tough, man. It's a tough, tough time. I think everybody's figuring it out as we go along. So, anyway, that's kind of the update there. Same thing with Thiago Tavares. Uh, we mentioned him as well. He's fighting in Brazil. You know, was was from everything I was told is that, listen, you know, they're not saying go away and don't ever come back. It's like, listen, I just don't have anything for you right now. If you want to fight, go fight. Go do your thing, and we wish you the best of luck, and, and maybe we can work together again down the line. So, interesting. All right. Back to Houston. Co-main event, Alexa Grasso versus Felice Herrig. Interesting fight here. Uh, Alexa Grasso, of course, the undefeated Mexican prospect. Doing a great job of learning English, by the way. Her English keeps getting better and better and better. Her striking, if you haven't seen Alexa Grasso fight, fun to watch fight. She's got great hands. You know, came from essentially a boxing background. Uh, coached by her family and, and uh, you know, a rising star in Mexico now. Didn't necessarily have the best debut ever, right? Her, her UFC debut, I should say. She, she debuted uh, earlier well, earlier this year. It's February. No, it wasn't earlier this year, my friend. Late last year against uh, Heather Joe Clark down in uh, Mexico City, UFC Fight Night 98. Picked up a decision win. Almost had the finish in the first round. Didn't get the finish. Uh, Clark proved her, her grittiness and, and, and gutted it out until the third round. And, and uh, the decision was clear. Uh, but, you know, I saw some mixed reviews of Grasso after that. A lot of people that hadn't seen her fight before were like, I don't get it. What's the big deal? What's everybody so hyped about? But, you know, talked to her a little bit today, and she said, listen, man, that was that was tough. You know, I was, and I'm telling you, man, she was treated like a star. The whole arena was there to watch her fight. Crazy. I mean, the expectations that must have been on her shoulders making a UFC debut in her home country of Mexico – Man, a tough spot. And I, and I thought she performed well. You know, d- d- were there things that she could have done better? Absolutely. Now, she's fighting Felice Herrig. Felice Herrig, gritty veteran, been around a long time as well. 11 wins, 6 losses, never been finished in her career. All of her losses have come by decision. So, you know, she's been in there with some of the best of them. And uh, she fought last in July and picked up a uh, performance bonus after submitting Kylan Curran at USC on Fox 20. And that was a great performance for Felice Herrig. And she said, listen, you know, I've had some issues. That performance was not, you know, a, a, an awesome night. You know, I was in Chicago, like her, you know, area where she lives. So it was it was important to her to, you know, it was a big fight really to, to kind of answer the critics and uh, to kind of prove that she has something. I think people were like, listen, man, is this, is this girl all flash? Because she's always been great at marketing herself. You know, she loves to take. Uh, you know, pr- provocative pictures, so to speak, and and, and market herself in that way. And, um, but I think a lot of people are saying, "Hey, I want to hear, I want to see some substance over it." And, and then she had this amazing performance. And she's saying, "Listen, I've got more of that in me. That was not a one night only thing. I've got more in me." But again, now facing the the, the younger up and comer in Alexa Grasso, so big fight in the co-main event here. Uh, I figured, you know, what the hell? I told you these scrums were short. <laughs> It was basically just me asking questions, so uh, why not hear from both of them? It's not going to take a long time. Hear what they both had to say to me uh, earlier today. Well, how much different is it, the feeling this time around being your second UFC fight? Uh, well, it's different because I did my camp in my hometown, in my city, in my gym, in my house, in my car, in my everything I know. So it was awesome after that hard training camp I had in Mexico City. I think it's amazing. and to be back so soon and I think I'm ready. 
How tough of a situation was it for you in your debut fight to be in Mexico uh, and have like, all the expectations? It felt like the whole country was was there, you know, just to see you. Yes, I I was very nervous. I had a lot of pressure on me. Uh, it was a really hard camp, you know, being in another city, uh, the altitude, everything was different, but that helped me so much, like an athlete and like a, like a human, because I learned a lot of me and my team and how how can we work so well to have a great performance. And, and what did you think about your performance in Mexico? Because you almost got the finish and then it you know, went to a decision and, and, and you know, so what did you think? Were you happy with yourself or did you feel like you left something there? Uh, I feel happy with myself. I know I was uh, a quite calm, but I didn't want to mess up, mess, mess up. I wanted to do everything perfect. I didn't want to have any risk, but I think I did amazing, and I'm going to do it better now. And what do you think of the matchup with Felice? Obviously another tough veteran of the sport. Yes, I, I know she's very, very well-rounded. She's very dangerous for me, but I've been training very hard for this fight. This is, this is a great opportunity, not just for uh, the weekend because it's full of people here. It's a great match for both of us. And lastly, for me, you're still so young in your UFC career, but people love your style, and they always say what you would look like against Yoanny and Jacek. Are you letting yourself think about that matchup already? Uh, I hope one day I can fight against her. I know she's amazing. I really want to fight like her, but I, I'm too far from the top ten. I'm really far from her, but I'm very. Uh, I'm working very hard to be in the top 10, then in the top 5, and I, and I hope at the end of the year I can be in the top 5, so next year maybe I can fight with her. You, you say you're too far away, but do you feel you're a top 5 fighter? I mean, not just because the number isn't there, but do you feel you're that good now? Or do you still... Uh, not now, but if I have the opportunity, I'm going to do my best, and I'm going to train as hard as never. Jabuga! At least last time we saw you was a fantastic performance by you. I want to ask how important that was to you. I mean, you've always dealt with critics and, and that sort of thing, but uh, how big was that win to you? Uh, you know, the win against Kylan Curran was uh, something that I always knew I had in me. Um, but it was really big because for me it was a turning point. It was, um, you know, before that I had kind of hit rock bottom. My body, just uh, from years and years of fighting, was put under so much stress. And I, I knew something was wrong, but didn't know what. And um, I had taken a year off, you know, I worked with the doctor, Dr. Cowan, and he did all these lab, like, he did all these labs on me, and, and we fine-tuned my body and got it back to being normal so that I could fight at peak performance. Interesting. So what did that entail? Was that a diet change, or...? or a no, it was actually, um, like, my cortisol levels were depleted, like, I didn't produce, I didn't have enough melatonin to, like, get a good night's sleep, so it was pretty much, he's a nature path, so I just worked on, like, getting my levels back up. Um, it was this, this oh, systematic regimen, like get up at 6 a.m. and take this, and then before workout I would take this, and then with lunch I would take this and that, and you know, we just kind of built my body back up um, naturally uh, and safely, and all USADA approved, so that's good. Interesting. Did, did, did that play into why? Because I wondered, uh, it's been a while since you fought. I mean, did that play into why it took so long to get another fight for you? Uh, no, you know what? Actually, things just weren't lining up. After I fought Kylan, like, I was offered a fight, but I was a bridesmaid and a wedding. And, you know, I've, I've spent 14 years fighting and dedicating my entire life to fighting. Not that I haven't loved that, but I've also, you know, um, wanted to get back to, to being Felice the human being. And I think that it's nice to take a little time off just to recoup and uh, come back and remember why, why I love the sport and not, and not be burnt out o over it. So things just kind of played out the way they did. I was going to say, what do you think when they came to you with this matchup? Obviously, you know she's the, the hot up-and-comer that everybody's high on and, and you're the veteran. What, what did you think about it? Honestly, I was really excited for this fight, for this matchup. Um, just, you know, I think I'm at, a, I'm at a good place mentally and physically again and um, I think styles make fights and I just... I'm just at a point in my career where I just want to go out there and put on fun, exciting fights for the fans, and I want, I want to put on fights that like people are excited for and, and pumped up about, and I'm pumped up because I really think that you know it could be like fight of the night, and I think it's just it's gonna be fun to watch. All right, so big co-main event there with the ladies. Uh, a couple of good, couple of good fights up here. Abel Trujillo versus James Vick. Now I think this is one that's kind of sliding under the radar, right? I haven't heard many people talking about this, but I like this fight a lot. Odds makers have it as a pick 'em. Uh, I went with Abel Trujillo here, kind of leaning towards his wrestling a little bit. You know, a little bit maybe more well-rounded skill set. Now he's going to have a big uh, height differential, range differential to deal with. Uh, 
Abel Trio did tell me, uh, you know, he's part of that Black Zillions team that's kind of revamping, I guess, right now. You got Glenn Robinson saying, you know, the Black Zillions are still going to be around, but certainly right now they're not going to be around in their same form. And, and uh, Abel decided to kind of head out and do his own thing. Didn't want the distractions. Kind of put together a training camp around himself. We'll see if that helps. Sometimes it's tough. You know, when, when you don't have anybody there to push you and you're kind of the one calling the shots, that can be bad, you know, because you might not push yourself as hard as somebody else. But it can be a good thing, too. You know, you know exactly what you need. You, you know exactly what, you, what you, you need to work on and what you want to work on, that sort of thing. So we'll be interested to see. But, I mean, Abel Trujillo, 10-2. and two. Think about this. 10-2 and two in his last 12 fights. Only losses in there. Habib never going to off. And Tony Ferguson. How about that? Lost to the two guys that are fighting for the interim title here coming up soon. And that's it. Beat everybody else. So this is a big night for him. Of course, James Vick as well. Uh, come off that loss. You know, a lot of hype here. He's a Texan. The Texecutioner from Mineral Wells, Texas. He's fighting in his home state, which is, is a fellow proud Texan. I can tell you that uh, we are probably annoyingly proud of our state. And <laughs> that's just the way we're brought up. And uh, I know he's excited to be fighting here in his home state. He's coming off a big loss. You know, he had a nice little run going and, and lost bad to Benil Dariush uh, this past June at UFC 199. That was a crazy night of fights there in Los Angeles. Benil Dariush just caught him. And uh, James Vick said, hey, listen, I just got caught. You know, nothing to, nothing to hold my head down about. You know, it, it happens in the fight game. And he actually he said today he was actually pretty proud of himself because he didn't get knocked down by one shot. You know, he got knocked down by 20. Uh, that was pretty interesting to say. You know, it's like, listen, dude, yeah, I got caught, but look how many shots it, it took to put me down. So I kind of respected his attitude there. So love that fight. Really do. Uh, also, uh, Volkan Ozdemir, the first Swiss fighter uh, making his way to the UFC. Had a chance to meet him this week. Had never talked to him before. Sat down. If you want to hear from him, uh, that's on YouTube. Get the full full uh, interview with me. It's just a one-camera setup. It's not like the nice two cameras that we do when cold coffee's around because – he gets everything set up nice. I, I just set it up like a little scrum, but had a chance to talk to him. Good attitude. Uh, you know, guy had an interesting story. He's going to fight for the heavyweight title in Titan. Got the call up and and uh, a couple weeks ago in Titan. Right away, let him let him out his fight. Day before the fight, Titan let him out. So don't worry about it, buddy. Know you want to be in the UFC. Your call's here. Hey, we're standing down. But that was a pretty pretty bold move there. So he's stepping in, is making his debut. Been living and training in Florida. English is is uh, fantastic. And uh, he's got some size to him. And he, and he says, listen, I'm not intimidated to step in and face Ovent St. Pru. I know Ovent St. Pru fought for a title this past year. I know he's a top contender, but that's what I want to be. I want to be a top contender, so I am not concerned at all. Now, will Vulcan have the UFC jitters? Will, is, he, is he stepping in out of his element a little too early? I don't know. We'll find out. But this is a, this is a, a big fight. Also, uh, had a chance to speak to Ovent St. Pru this week for a little bit. And uh, I really did enjoy talking to Vince. He had some really interesting things to say about mental preparation. And uh, I, I don't know. He was just seemed in a good place. Sometimes uh, OSP doesn't necessarily seem like that. In, you know, kind of, I don't know, like he's just oh, bored. <laughs> and maybe that's my fault. Maybe that, maybe maybe our, our crappy interviews are, are part of the reason. But he had some really interesting things to say about um, kind of, you know, really dialing in his mental focus and, Talking about his coach basically giving him homework, you know, when he gets done to, to keep him mentally engaged in the fight and uh, in, in practice and training and all those things. And I don't know, I thought it was, it was interesting. And he actually gave a shout out to Conor McGregor and said, man, he just really respects that about Conor McGregor, man. He's he's uh, He's got the middle game down to a science. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, Marcel Fortuna, uh, uh, Anthony Hamilton, uh, interesting fight here. Uh, Marcel is a newcomer, jiu-jitsu expert, coming to the, coming to the UFC uh, against Anthony Hamilton – Who's you know had had some some successes and some struggles. We'll see. We'll see what Marcel has. Um, I don't know, man. I, I, you hate to say that Anthony Hamilton is like weak on on submission just because he got absolutely mauled <laughs> uh, when he fought Francis Nagano. I mean, jeez, uh, when thinking of Francis Nagano, man, he'll he'll pretty much do anything he wants to you, right? I mean, that's that's amazing. I don't I don't even know if there was like great technique there. By Nagano in that in that Kimura victory that he had, I mean it was the the only submission. Uh, well, I take the back. He's had a handful of submissions. Only submission loss. Uh, in the no, you're, you know, I forgot about that neck crank too. Oof, Flexi Olenek. There's a beast of a submission expert there. So yeah, 
Yeah, okay, I'm going to go out on a limb. Anthony Hamilton, he's terrible at <laughs> submission defense. Uh, so maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a, an opportunity for uh, – Fortuna to step in here and, uh, and and make a name for himself. We'll, we'll see. Uh, and then, of course, the main card starts out with uh, a big fight there. Jessica Andrade versus Angela Hill. Man, the odds makers like Andrade big here. Uh, Hill's making a return. Uh, you know, booted from the UFC after, I mean, starting her career in the UFC. Just so raw. And then uh, had a 4-0 run outside of the promotion. Became the Invictus Strawweight champ. And now she's making her return to the UFC um, and she's uh, in good spirits about it. I had a chance to sit down and talk to her, and uh, here's what she had to say. Well, let's just start by talking about how it feels to be back. I mean, uh, it's got to be exciting, I imagine. Yeah, it's super exciting. Um, you know, I, I kind of felt like it was going to happen for a while, that, but now that it's actually here, it's like, I don't know, it's, it's just it's nice. I feel, um, I feel like I'm uh, back in the cool kids' club, so... <laughs> So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Very nice. Talk about the time away because you did, I mean, you had some success, obviously, 4-0 and Evicta, uh, you know, I think continued to gain traction and popularity and fans and all that, but was it a little bit frustrating to be outside of the cool kids club? Well, I mean, Evicta's cool too, you know, um, but I felt like uh, a lot of people kind of saw me as an outsider when I was brought into the UFC with only one fight. Um, all the other girls had either been fighting um, for a longer time or they've gone through Invicta and done that whole thing. So I kind of feel like I earned a lot of people's respect by going back to Invicta uh, or going to Invicta, uh, getting that win streak and winning the belt and then coming back. So it was, it was kind of like, it was kind of a backwards journey. Usually, usually people do Invicta first or do at least like get more fans first. But I feel like I was able to uh, earn a lot of respect to people who um, maybe before felt like I didn't deserve to be in the UFC. So, you know, kudos to that. <laughs> it was very true. Did you feel that way at the time? I wonder, because it's easy in retrospect to look back. Because I think it probably was good for your career, right? I mean, to, to try to jump in right away and be in the UFC is, is damn near impossible. You got to kind of step back and, and build yourself. But I wonder, like, did you see it at the time? Or were there moments where you're like, oh, me, me my career, this, that, yeah. that sort of thing? Well, you know, there, there, there's always that argument that I could have stuck around in the UFC and fought, um, you know, lower ranked people and gotten my experience that way. But, um, I mean, Nobody can really pick their fights in the UFC. You basically have to answer the call when they call you. Otherwise, you know, you never know when you're gonna get that uh, next fight. So, um, so it was probably better for me because I don't turn down fights. I'm just like, I'll fight whoever. Give me the, <laughs> and fucking rip the head off. And, um, and so it was probably better for me in retrospect to go to Invicta and, um, and just kind of build my experience that way by fighting people who weren't necessarily ranked in the top five of all straw weights. And, you know, uh, I did still fight like really tough competition. Like I, I still say that um, the girls that I fought in Invicta could easily compete in the UFC and uh, do well. Um, but uh, just not having that pressure and not having all those eyes on you and being able to kind of have fun with like weigh-ins and, and uh, you know, the photo shoots and stuff, it really allowed me to gain more fans and get more popularity. And I think, uh, yeah, all in all, I don't think I would have been able to fight four times in one year as well. Um, so yeah, a lot of, there were a lot of positives going to Invicta and getting that experience and yeah. Very nice. How about the uh, the false start of getting back in? What was that uh, emotion like to, to, to kind of be there and then it's it's taken yeah. away from you? Yeah. Well, it was it was a weird one because um, I had I had gotten a call from uh, uh, or an offer from Shelby to fight uh, Justine Kish first, but it was like two weeks after my fight and it was like a five round like battle. I had like uh, a tooth loose from getting head butted, so I was like. Ugh. Probably shouldn't, and my coach was like, "Yeah, you 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 got really messed up this fight camp as well. Let's uh, take a few weeks off and then get back into it." So when I saw that Andrade needed an opponent, I I hit up uh, my manager right away, and I was like, "Brian, give me that fight," you know. So um, so I it was almost like set in stone, and then I got the call from him saying that the USADA issue was a was a thing, and it wasn't gonna happen on 30th. So that sucked, um, but. I'm happy now just because 
I'm, I was still able to get that matchup because the matchup was the biggest thing for me. Like I knew UFC was looking at me. Um, I knew they wanted me for Kish or whoever really. Uh, but just the fact that I feel like this is a really winnable fight for me and Andrade's ranked so high um, as a strawweight, I felt like that was like just gonna be a really good start for me to just go in there beat her, beat the top, uh, the number five ranked straw weight, and then, you know, just make a huge splash in the 2000, 2017. So what is it about the matchup that you like? I mean, is it something about her style, or do you think, I mean, because she's looked pretty good since she dropped the 115, right? Yeah, she's, she's all right, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, um, but I, I, I see a lot of, uh, I just see a lot of opportunities to take advantage of the way she fights. Um, she's, she's big, she's strong, she's, well, should I turn this on? <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> she's big, she's strong, she's um, she's really aggressive in the first round, which is all we've really seen of her, just like first round, a little bit of the second. But um, but I see a lot of holes in her striking. I see uh, I see uh, she uses brute brute strength a lot with her with her scrambling with her takedowns, and I feel like all of that is something that I'm really good at dealing with. I've never ha really had a problem with bigger opponents. Really, the people who get me are the smaller guys with little little skinny arms get around your neck. Um, but like when it comes to brute strength, I'm used to that. Um, you know, just with training with guys and and bigger girls, it's it's something that I'm a little more comfortable with dealing with. And uh, the reason I actually went to Alliance is so I could get used to dealing with the really skilled smaller opponents. So um, so yeah, I feel like I'm really prepared for this fight. Interesting, and you said she's high ranked, so I mean if you, if you pick up this win, I mean you're gonna be right there back in the mix. If you feel, you know, a year later, now it is time to face those top tier, top tier fighters? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think there's a handful of people who are, are pretty scary in the division, um, and I feel like I've already fought half of them. So you know why not? Uh, I'm ready for it. <laughs> yeah, I guess if I heard your words right, you, you don't necessarily feel like the champ is one of those scary people. Ah, oh, I mean, I think I think uh, the way that me and the champ would match up is a lot different from most people because most people they they think okay, take down, you know, take down, submit, or take down and hold. Um, and you know when she fought uh, Godella and when she fought uh, Carolina come Flata Flitch, uh, you know I they would hit her and it would hurt her, but then they'd go for a takedown and it's like why are you wasting your energy doing that when you just keep hitting her and hurting her? Um, so so yeah, I feel like um, I'd have a different strategy from everyone else who's like tried to out out. Uh, wrestle her and lost because she has really good takedown defense. Um, but yeah, that wouldn't be my game plan against her. So that's why I feel like it's an easier fight than someone like this who just tries to do everything. They try to knock you out, they try to take you down, they try to submit you, like they try it all. It'd stylistically, it'd be a lot of fun, that's for sure. Yeah, so. I think so. <laughs> well, maybe, you know, some people might not have Fight Pass, they might not, you know, watch Invictus. So, I mean, if they, if they saw your UFC run and, and they haven't seen anything since, I mean, what, what do you think the difference is? What are, what are people gonna pick up on that, that, that's different this time around? Uh, they're just gonna pick up on uh, me being more comfortable in there. Like I, I have more of a style now. It's more of an MMA style, not really just a Muay Thai fighter fighting in a cage. I'm more of an MMA fighter who has really solid striking. So um, I think that's what they're gonna see, and I think they're gonna be impressed. All right, so that is your FS1 main card. Of course, the preliminary card, uh, you got four fights on FS1 as well, so you're going to get ten fights on FS1 uh, on Saturday. Curtis Blades and Adam Milstead, the, the featured heavyweight match there. Chris Grutzemacher and Chaz Skelly. Talk about two guys with incredible career records that uh, don't get a lot of love and respect, man. They're grinders, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but both of them, man, they, they are capable of doing good things, and they've got great career records to prove it. Uh, Ricardo Lucas Ramos and Michinori Tanaka, and, of course, Beck Rawlings and Tisha Torres. We heard from Beck earlier. Uh, spoke to Tisha as well. She, uh, she she feels like she's in a good position. You know, lost her last fight. Uh, it was a, a, a very close fight, she admits. Yeah, pro probably probably was the right decision. She lost, of course, uh, to Rose Nama Yunus at USC on Fox 19. She said, it, hey, listen, it, it probably was. You know, there were some things I could have done to change. 
Um, but she still believes she's very much right there, uh, you know, kind of in the title picture, especially with, um, you know, kind of the division still mapping itself out a little bit. So it is a, uh, it's a big week in the strawweight division. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of big fights happen on this card. This, this ends up being a, a kind of an important card for the strawweights. And, of course, the two fights you have on at USC Fight Pass, Alex Morono, Nico Price. By the way, Nico Price, if you're not familiar with him, uh, he made his UFC debut on short notice at UFC 207 in December. Uh, so we're talking about just what, like six weeks ago. Submitted Brandon Thatch, uh, looked looked fantastic doing it, uh, and and was like right away saying, "Book me again, book me again, book me in again." They got him on another fight card, and uh, every time I saw him at the hotel this week when I was over there working, he was just like, "I told you I'd be back. Here I am. I told you I'd be back. Here I am." <laughs> so this kid is full of energy all in fight week, and. Uh, you know, he's 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 a guy that uh, Alex Davis, his manager, had told me about him. Said, "Look, I, this you know, I, I went and found this kid. I think he's extremely talented. So, somebody keep your eye on." But Alex Morono, if you'll remember, uh, Alex Morono, his last time out picked up that hard fought win over James Muntazri. Man, that was uh, one that I thought you know Muntazri was going to be able to beat him with that you know fantastic striking that he has. But um, that's not how it went down. So that was kind of a, 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 a you know fun little result there for him as well. So I think that's a, a fun little fight. To keep an eye on on USC Fight Pass, and then uh, the night starts out with Daniel Jolly versus Khalil Roundtree. Uh, we're uh, the MMA Roadshow is fans of Khalil Roundtree. I've uh, saw him come up through the amateur ranks, and of course he, he trains in Vegas, and we had a chance to speak to him quite a bit during his run on uh, the Ultimate Fighter. So um, definitely no question about it, he is in a must-win situation right now. Uh, but uh, I'll be interested in that fight. So yeah. A card that uh, not 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 gonna be a lot of media here. I will actually be in the back. So if you're looking for the blue shirt on Fight Night, in fact, if you want to win a bet with somebody, I tell you, tell them I bet you won't see Morgan on the broadcast tonight. <laughs> uh, I'm the video guy with cold coffee not here. Uh, I will uh, I, I will be in the back, so you will see me back there uh, shooting all the post fight interviews that we do, and uh, Matt Erickson will be out front handling everything on the front end out there. So. Yeah, maybe if you want to be like, dude, I bet Morgan's blue shirt's not going to be there. Like, nah, I know he's in Houston. That's all I'm tweeting. You listened all the way to the end of the road show, so you got the advantage. <laughs> all right, listen, uh, I don't want to make you hear my uh, damn voice any longer. Uh, Cold Coffee will be back on the road with me next week, so we will have the crew back together in Brooklyn for UFC 208. Before that, though, I will get together with you this weekend for an and a half so we can talk about everything that happens at UFC Fight Night 104. In the meantime... Thanks for listening.